All right, here we go. Chapter 2 of The Princess Bride. Chapter 2 is The Groom, because if you don't remember, Chapter 1 was called The Bride. And Chapter 1 is mostly about Buttercup. So if you haven't figured it out, Buttercup is the bride in The Princess Bride. The Groom is going to be Prince Humperdinck. It's a great name. And this chapter also starts with that italic writing again, so... This is the author interrupting the story and explaining a little bit about his uh, quote-unquote editing, which, again, is part of his like shtick for the book. So, here we go. The Princess Bride, Chapter 2, The Groom. This is my favorite major excision. Chapter 1, The Bride, is almost in its entirety about the bride. Chapter 2, The Groom, only picks up Prince Humpertink in the last few pages. This chapter is where my son Jason stopped reading, and there's simply no way of blaming him, for what Morgan Stern has done is open this chapter with 66 pages of Florinese history. More accurately, it is the history of the Florinese crown. Dreary not to be believed. Why would a master of narrative stop his narrative dead before it was such much chance to begin generating? No known answer. All I can guess is that for Morgan Stern, the real narrative was not Buttercup and the remarkable things she endures, but rather the history of the monarchy and other such stuff. When this version comes out, I expect every Florinese scholar alive to slaughter me. Columbia University is not only the leading Florinese experts in America, but also direct ties to the New York Times book review. I can't help that, and I only hope they understand my intentions here are in no way meant to be destructive of Morgan Stern's vision. Prince Humperdinck was shaped like a barrel. His chest was a great barrel chest, his thighs mighty barrel thighs. He was not tall, but he weighed close to 250 pounds, brick hard. He walked like a crab, side to side, and probably, if he had wanted to be a ballet dancer, he would have been doomed to a miserable life of endless frustration. But he didn't want to be a ballet dancer. He wasn't in that much of a hurry to be king, either. Even war, at which he excelled, took second place in his affections. Everything took second place in his affections. Hunting was his love. He made it a practice never to let a day go by without killing something. It didn't much matter what. When he first grew dedicated, he killed only big things, elephants or pythons. But then, as his skills increased, he began to enjoy the suffering of little beasts, too. He could happily spend an afternoon tracking a flying squirrel across forests or a rainbow trout down rivers. Once he was determined, once he had focused on an object, the prince was relentless. He never tired, never wavered, never ate, uh, neither ate nor slept. It was death chess, and he was international grandmaster. In the beginning, he traversed the world for opposition, but travel consumed time, ships and horses being what they were, and the time away from Florin was worrying. There always had to be a male heir to the throne, and as long as his father was alive, there was no problem. But someday his father would die, and then the prince would be the king, and he would have to select a queen to supply an heir for the day of his own death. So to avoid the problem of absence, Prince Humperdinck built the Zoo of Death, and he designed it himself with Count Rugen's help, and he sent his hirelings across the world to stock it for him. Hang on. Let's go back to the map to show you guys the Zoo of Death and its location because later in the book it might be helpful to know. So here you see on the castle grounds the Zoo of Death is in the top right corner of the actual grounds next to that wall. Uh, and it will be good to know later in the story but that's that's basically the idea of the zoo of death i think it's a little more hidden than even that is let's go back here yeah battery's fine all right it was kept brimming with things that he could hunt and it really wasn't like any other animal sanctuary anywhere in the first place there were never any visitors only the albino keeper to make sure the beasts were properly fed and that there was never any sickness or weakness inside. The other thing about the zoo was that it was underground. 
The prince picked the spot himself in the quietest, remotest corner of the castle grounds, and he decreed there were to be five levels, all with the proper needs for his individual enemies. On the first level, he put enemies of speed, wild dogs, cheetahs, hummingbirds. On the second level belonged the enemies of strength, anacondas and rhinos and crocodiles of over 20 feet. The third level was for poisoners, spitting cobras, jumping spiders, death bats galore. The fourth level was the kingdom of the most dangerous, the enemies of fear, the shrieking tarantula, the only spider capable of sound, the blood eagle, the only bird that thrived on human flesh, plus in its own black pool, the sucking squid. Even the albino shivered during feeding time on the fourth level. The fifth level was empty. The prince constructed it in the hopes of someday finding something worthy, something as dangerous and fierce and powerful as he was. Unlikely, still, he was an eternal optimist, so he, cre he kept the great cage of the fifth level always in readiness, and there, really w and there was really more than enough that was lethal on the other four levels to keep a man happy. The prince would sometimes choose his prey by luck. He had a great wheel with a spinner, and on the outside of the wheel was a picture of every animal in the zoo, and he could sw twirl the spinner at breakfast, and wherever it stopped, the albino would ready that breed. Sometimes he would choose by mood. I feel quick today. Fetch me a cheetah. Or, I feel strong today. Release a rhino. And whatever he requested, of course, was done. One quick thing about the levels of the zoo of death, they are going level by level down so level one is the very top level even though it's all underground and level five is the deepest level the bottom level he was ringing down the curtain on an orangutan when the business of the king's health made its ultimate intrusion it was mid-afternoon and the prince had been grappling with the giant beast since morning and finally after all these hours the hairy thing was weakening Again and again, the monkey tried to bite, a sure sign of failure of strength in the arms. The prince warded off the attempted bites with ease, and the ape was heaving at the chest now, desperate for air. The prince made a crab-like step sideways, then another, then darted forward, spun the great beast into his arms, began applying pressure to the spine. This was all taking place in the ape pit, where the prince had his pleasure with many simians. From up above now, Count Rugen's voice interrupted. There is news, the count said. From battle, the prince replied, Can it not wait? For how long? asked the count. Crack! The orangutan fell like a rag doll. Now, what is it? What is all this? the prince replied, stepping past the dead beast, mounting the ladder out of the pit. Your father has had his annual physical, the count said. I have the report. And your father is dying. Drat, said the prince. That means I shall have to get married. All right, so chapter two is pretty short about Prince Humperdinck. Uh, but that's really the most important stuff to know about him is how much he does not want to be the king and how much he loves and excels at hunting and killing things. So we'll move on to chapter three, the courtship. And if you weren't familiar with courtship, let's see, this should work. Courtship, noun, a period during which a couple develop a romantic relationship before getting married. And that's what the chapter two ended with, knowing that the prince now has to get married because his father is not long for this world. So this is chapter three, the courtship. Four of them met in the great council room of the castle. Prince Humperdinck, his confidant, Count Rugen, his father, aging King Lotharon, and Queen Bella, his evil stepmother. Queen Bella was shaped like a gumdrop and colored like a raspberry. She was easily the most beloved person in the kingdom and had been married to the king long before he began mumbling. Prince Humperdinck was but a child then, and since the only stepmothers he knew were the evil ones from stories, he always called Bella that, or E.S. for short. All right, the prince began when they were all assembled. Who do I marry? Let's pick a bride and get it done. Aging King Lotharon said, 
I've been thinking it's really getting to be about time for Humperdinck to pick a bride. He didn't actually so much say that as mumble it. I remember, remember, hump mumble and gum mumble. Queen Bella was the only one who bothered ferreting out his meanings anymore. You couldn't be right, dear, she said, and she patted his royal robes. What did he say? He said whoever we decided on would be getting a thunderously handsome prince for a lifetime companion. Tell him he's looking quite well himself, the prince returned. We've only just changed miracle men, the queen said. That accounts for the improvement. You mean you fired Miracle Max, Prince Humperdinck said. I thought he was the only one left. No, we found another one up in the mountains, and he's quite extraordinary. Old, of course, but then who wants a young Miracle Man? Tell him I've changed Miracle Men, King Lutheran said. It came out, tell Mumble, Mumble, Mumble. What did he say, the prince wondered. He said a man of your importance couldn't marry just any princess. True, true, Prince Humperdinck said. He sighed deeply. I suppose that means Norina. That would certainly be a perfect match politically, Count Rugen allowed. Princess Norina was from Gilder, the country that lay just across Florent, the Florin Channel. In Gilder, they put it differently. For them, Florin was a country on the other side of the Channel of Gilder. In any case, the two countries had stayed alive over the centuries, mainly by warring on each other. There had been the Olive War, the Tunafish Discrepancy, which almost bankrupted both nations, the Roman Rift, which did send them both into insolvency, only to be followed by the Discord of the Emeralds, in which they both got rich again chiefly by banding together for a brief period and robbing everybody within sailing distance. I wonder if she hunts, though, said a humperdink. I don't care so much about personality, just so they're good with a knife. I saw her several years ago, Queen Bella said. She seemed lovely, though hardly muscular. I would describe her more as a knitter than a doer, but again, lovely. Skin, asked the prince. Marbleish, answered the queen. Lips. Number or color, asked the queen. Color, E.S. Roses. Cheeks the same, eyes largest, one blue, one green. Hmm, said Humperdinck. And form. Our glasses. Always closed divinishly. And of course, famous throughout Gilda for the largest hat collection in the world. Well, let's bring her over here for some state occasions and have a look at her, said the prince. Isn't there a princess in Gilder that might be about the right age? said the king. It came out, Mamsis Gilbel, a bumble mumble. Are you never wrong? said Queen Bella as she smiled into the weakening eyes of her ruler. What did he say? wondered the prince. That I should leave this very day with an invitation, replied the queen. So began the great visit of the princess Norina. Me again. Of all the cuts in this version, I feel most justified in making this one. Just as the chapters on whaling in Moby Dick can be omitted by all but the most punishment-loving readers, so the packing scenes that Morganson details here are really best left alone. That's what happens for the next 56 and a half pages of The Princess Bride. Packing. I include unpacking scenes in the same category. What happens is just this. Queen Bella packs most of her wardrobe, 11 pages, and travels to Gilder, 2 pages. In Gilder, she unpacks, five pages, then tenders the invitation to Princess Norina, one page. Princess Norina accepts, one page. Then Princess, Princess Norina packs all her clothes and hats, 23 pages. And together, the princess and queen travel back to Florin for the annual celebration of the founding of Florin City, one page. They reach King Lotharon's castle, where Princess Norina is shown her quarters, a half page, and unpacks all the same clothes and hats we've just seen her pack one and a half pages before. Twelve pages. It's a baffling passage. I spoke to Professor Bongiorno of Columbia University, the head of their Florinese department, and he said this was the most deliciously satiric chapter in the entire book, Morgenstern's point, apparently, being simply to show that although Florin considered itself vastly more civilized than Gilder, Gilder was, in fact, 
the far more sophisticated country, as indicated by the superiority in number and quantity of the ladies' clothes. I'm not about to argue with a full professor, but if you have ever really have an unbreakable case of insomnia, do yourself a favor and start reading chapter 3 of the uncut version. Anyway, things pick up a bit once the prince and princess meet and spend the day. Norina did have, as advertised, marvelous skin, rosish lips and cheeks, largest eyes, one blue, one green, hourglassish form, and easily the most extraordinary collection of hats ever assembled. Wide-brimmed and narrow, some tall, some not, some fancy, some colorful, some plaid, some plain. She doted on changing hats at every opportunity. When she met the prince, she was wearing one hat. When he asked her for a stroll, she excused herself, shortly to return wearing another, equally flattering. Things went on like this throughout the day, but it seems to me a bit too much court etiquette for modern readers, so it's not till the evening meal that I return to the original text. Dinner was held in the great hall of Lotharen's castle. Ordinarily, they would all have supped in the dining room, but for an event of this importance, the place was simply too small. So tables were placed end to end along the center of the great hall, an enormous drafty spot that was given to being chilly even in the summertime. There were many doors and giant entranceways, and the wind gusts sometimes reached gale force. This night was more typical than less. The winds whistled constantly, and the candles constantly needed relighting, and some of the more daringly dressed ladies shiv uh, shivered. But Prince Humberdink didn't seem to mind, and in Florin, if he didn't, you didn't either. At 8.23, there seemed every chance of a lasting alliance starting between Florin and Gilder. At 8.24, the two nations were very close to war. What happened was simply this. At 8.23 and 5 seconds, the main course of the evening was ready for serving. The main course was essence of brandied pig, and you need a lot of it to serve 500 people. So, in order to hasten the serving, a giant double door that led from the kitchen to the great hall was opened. The giant double door was on the north end of the room. The door remained open throughout what followed. The proper wine for essence of brandied pig was in readiness behind the double door that led eventually to the wine cellar. This double door was opened at 8.23 and 10 seconds in order that a dozen wine stewards could get their kegs quickly to the eaters. This double door, it might be noted, was at the south end of the room. At this point, an unusually strong crosswind was clearly evident. Prince Humperdinck did not notice, because at that moment he was whispering with the Princess Norina of Gilder. He was cheek to cheek with her, his head under her wide-brimmed blue-green hat, which brought out that exquisite color in both of her largest eyes. At 8.23 and 20 seconds, King Lutheran made his somewhat belated entrance to the dinner. He was always belated now, had been for years, and in the past people had been known to starve before he got there. But of late, meals just began without him, which was fine with him since his new miracle man had taken him off meals anyway. The king entered through the king's door, a huge hinged thing that only he was allowed to use. It took several servants in excellent condition to work it. It should be reported that the king's door was always in the east side of any room, since the king was, of all people, closest to the sun. What happened then has been variously described as a norther or sou'wester, depending on where you were seated in the room when it struck, but all hands agree on one thing. At 8.23 and 25 seconds, it was pretty gusty in the great hall. Most of the candles lost their flames and toppled, which was only important because a few of them fell, still burning, into a small kerosene cups that were placed here or there across the banquet table so the essence of brandied pig could be properly flaming when served. Servants rushed in from all over to put out the flames, and they did a good enough job, considering that everything in the room was flying this way, that way, fans and scarves and hats, particularly the hat of Princess Norina. It flew off to the wall behind her, where she quickly retrieved it and put it on properly on. That was at 8.23 and 50 seconds. It was too late. At 8.23.55, Prince Humperdinck rose, roaring, the veins in his thick neck etched like hemp. There were still flames in some places, and their redness reddened his already blood-filled face. He looked as he stood there like a barrel of fire. He then said to Princess Norina of Gilder the five words that brought the nations to the brink. Madam, feel free to flee! 
and with that he stormed from the great hall. The time was then 8.24. Prince Humperdinck made his angry way to the balcony above the great hall and stared down at the chaos. The fires were still in places flaming red. Guests were pouring out through the doors, and Princess Norina, hatted and faint, was being carried by her servants far from view. Queen Bella finally caught up with the prince, who stormed along the balcony, clearly not yet in control. "'I do wish you hadn't been quite so blunt,' Queen Bella said. The prince whirled on her. "'I'm not marrying any bald princess, and that's that!' "'No one would,' Queen Bella explained. "'She has hats even for sleeping.' "'I would know,' cried the prince. "'Did you see the candlelight reflecting off her skull?' But things would have been so good with Gilda, the queen said, addressing herself half to the prince, half to Count Rugen, who now joined them. Forget about Gilda. I'll conquer it sometime. I've been wanting to ever since I was a kid anyway, he approached the queen. People snicker behind your back when you've got a bald wife, and I can do without that, thank you. You'll just have to find someone else. Who? Find me somebody. She should just look nice, that's all. That Norina has no hair, King Lotharon said, puffing up to the others. No rumble, rumble, rumble. Thank you for pointing that out, dear, said Queen Bella. I don't think Humperdinck would like that, said the king. Dumble, humble, rumble. Then Count Rugen stepped forward. She wants someone who looks nice, but what if she is a commoner? The commoner the better, Prince Humperdinck replied, pacing again. What if she can't hunt? The Count went on. I don't care if she can't spell, the Prince said. Suddenly he stopped and faced them all. I'll tell you what I want, he began then. I want someone who is so beautiful that when you see her you say, Wow, that Humperdinck must be some kind of fella to have a wife like that. Search the country, search the world, just find her. Count Rugen could only smile. She is already found, he said. It was dawn when the two horsemen reined in at the hilltop. Count Rugen rode a splendid black horse, large, perfect, powerful. The prince rode one of his whites. It made Rugen's mount seem like a plow puller. She delivers milk in the mornings, Count Rugen said. And she is truly without question, no possibility of error beautiful. She was something of a mess when I saw her, the count admitted, but the potential was overwhelming. A milkmaid, the prince ran the words across his rough tongue. I don't know that I could wed one of them, even under the best conditions. People might snicker that she was the best I could do. True, the count admitted. If you prefer, we can ride back to Florence City without waiting. We've come this far, the prince said. We might as well wait. His voice quite simply died. I'll take her, he managed finally, as Buttercup rode slowly by below them. No one will snicker, I think, the Count said. I must court her now, said the Prince. Leave us alone for a minute. He rode the white expertly down the hill. Buttercup had never seen such a giant beast, or such a rider. I am your Prince and you will marry me, Humperdinck said. Buttercup whispered, I am your servant and I refuse. I am your Prince and you cannot refuse. I am your loyal servant and I just did. Refusal means death. Kill me, then. I am your prince, and I'm not that bad. How could you rather be dead than married to me? Because, Buttercup said, marriage involves love, and that is not a pastime at which I excel. I tried once, and it went badly, and I am sworn never to love another. Love, said Prince Humperdinck. Who mentioned love? Not me, I can tell you. Look, there must always be a male heir to the throne of Florence. That's me. Once my father dies, it won't be an heir, just a king. That's me again. When that happens, I'll marry and have children until there is a son. So you can either marry me and be the richest, most powerful woman in a thousand miles and give turkeys away at Christmas and provide me a son, or you can die in terrible pain in the very near future. Make up your own mind. I'll never love you. I wouldn't want it if I had it. Then by all means, let us marry. And that's chapter three. Chapter four is called The Preparations. I'll read that next.